century Christians who were under the Roman Empire who had no rights to buy or sell land or to be able to even buy food for their families and who are always under the fear of persecution. Lord, we just thank you for our rights and help us to never take those for granted and help us to realize that we do live in the land of the home of the free and the brave. And help us always to remember that if we want to be a great nation, that we must be one nation under God, that we have integrity, that we follow our principles and they will always follow you. Lord, be with us tonight as we discuss the business of our country, of our state, and of our county. Go with us and guide us always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Please have a seat. Okay, technical director, you've changed our screen. What do you want to see? I want to see our representative, our, our special, special guest. There she is. <laughs> now, you know, most of y'all don't know, I've been in Brown County County for a long time, a native Texan, so I'm in a minority. But when I get calls from Austin that say a new star has been born, a new star is arising in Collie County, and you can be proud of it. And I am very proud to know her on a personal basis. We served on the grand jury for seven months together, and we hung four people, right? <laughs> 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 As long as they're Democrats. District 89, <laughs> District 89 which includes Wiley, Woo! and uh, East uh, Plano, East Dallas, and, East Dallas. East Dallas. All right. and everybody's familiar with this website. We've talked about it several times. But you want to know her accomplishments and what she's involved in, you go to the 
Texas House of Representatives and review all of her activities. But we don't need to do that this evening because we have her present. <laughs> Young lady, would you please tell us what's making you famous and, and uh, the big city hall? No, I'm going to do that. But, hey, thank y'all so much for having me with her. Yeah, you're pleasure. awesome. And yeah, we did some fun grand jury today. I'm so glad to be back among sane people. Um, not that Austin's insane, but there are people that are insane that live there. And, uh, and it was, it's really interesting how different mindsets are when you get out of Collin County and uh, just how amazing uh, folks that I serve and I'm so grateful for that and um, you know I, I, I kind of you asked me to speak a little bit about, um, on what it was like as a freshman and and I was blessed to be a freshman and I was blessed um, I would have loved there, for there to be some other freshman Republican women, but I was the only freshman Republican woman, and so uh, there were lots of freshman Democrat women that served alongside of me. Oh boy, they were different. <laughs> Leave it there. You can watch the videos on, online if you like to of the Texas House floor, and you'll see um, that they were uh, a, a bit different, even for the Democrat. Even the Democrat leadership had some trouble with them. They stepped on some toes there. I was blessed to have uh, some mentorship from some of our other Collin County representatives, from Jeff Leach and Matt Shaheen and, and Scott Sanford. And, and Jerry Madden gave me some very wise advice along the way. He was, I told somebody he was both uh, uh, encouraging and gave good advice. And those are those are really good combinations for, for me to have along the way because uh, believe it or not, not everybody's happy with everything you do. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, you know, if you aren't from Texas, you may not understand that Texas really, our forefathers, you know, after, during Reconstruction, really wanted government out of the <coughs> business. And so they said, you know, we only want our legislature to meet every other year. And they had a sense of humor, so they made it odd years. And so we meet in odd years. And we can only meet for 140 days. And the first 60 days, we can't even hear it. We can't even vote on a bill unless it's an emergency. And so those first 60 days, you get organized, you get in committees, and, and, and you do some pre preliminary stuff, and you hear from the governor. But really quickly after that, everything just goes nuts. You know, you're hearing all sorts of things. And um, early on, I met with our new speaker, and he said, what, do you, what committees do you want to serve on? And I said, well, uh, I tell you what, speaker, I'm, I don't have a business at home I'm trying to run. And a lot of them, men, you know, run their businesses even while they're down there. And by the way, y'all know it pays $600 a month, right? So when you yell at us and tell us you're paying our salary, just remember it's only the minimum wage. Uh, but um, I said, I'm not, I'm not, my kids are grown, so put me in, coach. You know, I'm ready, I'm ready to serve. And he took me at my word, and I was so pleasantly shocked and surprised when my committee assignments included Ways and Means and Human Services and General Investigating, three of the, well, they're all important. But through human services is now a very, very significant part of our Texas budget is going to those services, uh, Medicaid and CPS and those kind of um, very important issues that Republicans a lot of times just want to say no to but not really want to tackle in a, in a meaningful way. So it was, oh, it was such a, it was really my honor to serve there. Ways and Means, we did, we did some heavy lifting this time. We did some, some property tax. Uh, Changes reform and transparency is really proud to be part of that. And general investigating, you may not have ever heard of that committee because it's only made up of five House members. And our job is to investigate wrongdoing within state government and within our body. So what we do as that committee is, is um, an executive session. So let me tell you that we do do some heavy lifting in there, but it's not public until unless there's a need for a public hearing. So. Um, Anyway, that's another one. I also got, uh, was very honored to serve on the Republican Policy Committee, and we met every morning very early on days that we had a vote, and we looked through all the bills that were going to be voted on that day, and, and <coughs> then decided as Republicans if we were going to come against, you know, vote against that bill, if we were going to support that bill, if we were neutral. There's a lot of bills that are local bills, and, you know, People have strong opinions one way or the other, or have no opinions at all, and so we stay neutral on those. <coughs> so I have a lot of homework to do. Did, the, did that reading at night for the next day's bills, and uh, I found out that not everybody reads all the bills. 
I'm just one of them. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry can attest to that. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of reading, and I haven't read that much since college. Probably didn't read that much in college, so that was fun. Also got to serve on the board of the Texas. Um, and by the way, she understood everything that was in every bill. No, I didn't. No, <laughs> I had my desk mate. In fact, one of my bills I carried was a great bill that um, if you have an uh, after-school program at, in a school, and in the summertime, they have to move buildings. They actually lost their license for a temporary move. And then they had to get re-licensed the next year when they moved back to the regular school building. You know, there's lots of reasons in the summertime a after school program can't be in a building because renovations or whatever. And uh, I got up to do, uh, I laid out that bill, I went back to my seat, and my seatmate Steve Toth voted against the bill. And I said, were you trying to be funny? Because of course it passed. And he said, no, my staff told me to vote against it. And I said, vote against cutting red tape? And he said, is that what that did? <laughs> 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 so probably, neither he nor his staff understood what my bill did. But, but it did get signed by the governor, I'm proud of that. Um, we actually had 7,324 bills filed. Wow. Um, those were the bills that were not like, um, there's a lot of bills that are like honor, honoring people. I'm not counting those. Of those, uh, 1,429 passed and were signed by the governor, and the governor vetoed 58 bills. Um, all in all, the Texas House considered 11,911 bills. So that was a lot of reading. That was a lot. And then we had lots and lots of amendments. I don't know. How many amendments did we have on the budget? It was like 100 and, oh, the budget was 300. 300 and something. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of those were crazy, but uh, they were they were there nevertheless. Anyway, I uh, didn't want to take too much of your time. I actually had to go be on a conference call with TFRW this uh, this evening, but uh, I just so appreciate you guys and appreciate those of you who have already spoken to me, get my emails and get my updates of, um, of my kind of my take on what's going on down there and what's going on, you know, in the hearts and minds of. Uh, of Republicans around the state because we're all as different as the Texas terrain is uh, changes from one part to the other and and it is true that it takes a lot of teamwork to get anything done and through the House and the Senate and to the governor so really proud I did get to carry one piece of major Republican legislation um, I got to carry Senate Bill 22 in my in the house it was 1929 and the Senate got it through faster, so I picked up their bill, which was identical to mine, and I carried it, and that was the bill that um, makes sure that no Texas taxpayer dollars go to abortion providers or their affiliates. And I had the distinction of having the longest debate on the floor of the House over my bill, seven and a half hours. And so you. you have a lot of boring you, insomnia go watch that online it's very exciting and very boring for, for hours at a time as as we argued over whether or not that's a core function of government which I contend is not that um, uh, there's a lot of things we need to be doing as government and uh, funding well, abortion for money is not we're here to help you. Okay. okay and here very much appreciate you coming now, who's your administrative assistant? Is well, she, this is my chief of staff. Her <laughs> For those that don't know, Suzanne Bowers, Suzanne. she's awesome, and uh, she's my chief of staff. She was, she was, uh, she's experienced. She was Jody Longenberg's chief, chief of staff for 16 years, and now she took me on as a project. And uh, I will tell you that um, that was one of the advantages I had as a freshman that a lot of freshmen didn't have is someone that that didn't know all the answers but knew exactly who to call for the answers and I, that is so valuable and uh, I loved I loved having Suzanne on my team. Well, you know if you look out here there's a lot of Collin County's leadership sitting here. You sure okay? Sure and is. I want you to feel free to call upon us okay. at any time and you know Dixie and you know Phil I do. And you know Kay Bear. Oh I do. Okay. Now these people you may not know but Linnell yeah, and Carl. I met them tonight. Yeah, she's, my a, new friend. But she's a senior advisor to President Trump. And on the campaign side. <coughs> so you deal with uh, what's her name? Kellyanne Conway on a daily basis and everything. But a uh, heavyweight, okay? And you know Jerry Madden over here, of course. And you know Bill Ains or Arthur, okay? And who am I missing? Because, you know this well, there's, it's, showing it's, You're gonna uh, get in trouble by pointing. I know so you're gonna miss somebody. We we won't be behind you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
and eight paid staff people for, for Collin County. So we, we've, got a, we've got a built in staff for our Victory 2020 effort. So the money that we raise on top of that, we can use for the, the other things that we want to do instead of just having to raise money to pay the staff that we need to run the effort. That, that's wonderful news. Uh, I met uh, a weekend or two ago, there was an SREC meeting in Austin, and Carl Rove was there, and he announced uh, the volunteer engagement project that's going on here in, in uh, Texas. Uh, this project is working to find 100,000 volunteers across the state of Texas to go out and register voters. They're going to use micro-targeting uh, tools, you know, like Facebook and those guys do to bother us all the time. They're going to use micro-targeting tools to identify 1.4 million strong Republican voters here in Texas. They're going to focus on the top 41 counties, and we're one of them. Uh, and they are also going to be uh, targeting new people that move into Texas. They have lists of people that were Republicans in other states that are moving into Texas, and we're going to go talk to those folks. So we've got to, that, that helps with the voter registration effort. So the top and the bottom of my list, a lot's been accomplished. We've got a lot to do in the middle, a thousand details to deal with. But I want to make this the strongest Republican Party we've ever had, and that's saying a lot in this room. But we've got, we, I've got to learn from what uh, you guys have done over the last, how many decades? 52 years. 52 Five years. Decades. I've got to learn from that and build on that, and I've got to get other people to understand that the new people like me are standing on your shoulders, and uh, we just need to, to take what we can learn from you and move it forward. So I, I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, I'm happy to, to talk to any of you anytime. Uh, so I want to thank you, Dr. What's your phone number? Uh, my personal cell is 214-707-8899. Uh, Are you on the website yet? Uh, my my e my email address is chairman at collingop.org. All right, so people contact you, they got to return a phone call. Absolutely. All right, and we don't have to go through. Give me a day or two, but okay. <laughs> and we don't have to go through the executive director. We can come direct. Direct with me. Yeah. Oh, well, I saw wish him well, and thank you for your courtesy and extending the vision. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. Thanks. All right. Brief type intermission. Anybody want a water, coke, or whatever? We'll take a minute as we go here and get ready for our speaker. And uh, when we do that, I'm going to break things up just a bit. I talked about Jerry Yancey. When were you president of this club? 1978. If everybody wants to know who you are, you better stand up. <laughs> 1978. When were you county chair? From 1992 to 1998. Okay. You saw a lot of growth in our party, haven't you? I did. That was a period of very strong growth, of which I am very proud. All right. Thank you for your service. Now, were you, did, did Dixie over here uh, recruit you, or did you recruit Dixie? <laughs> no, uh, I, recruit I don't know about ever. that. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, Dixie, this is our intermission. Let's take a deep breath for a couple of minutes here. Dixie, stand up for a place, young lady. So this is our leader of our party. And uh, Dixie, y'all got the first Republican judge elected in Collin County. Well, way, way, way back when, we opened the office December the 2nd, 1968, with $350. And you don't ever want to go back in. But anyway, we didn't have very many people. And the first office that we won was a constable seat. And then it came along, and the next day, we won a sheriff, which was George Spin. And um, I don't know where he is today, but then we went on and we, we ran uh, a commissioner that we didn't win it, and uh, Jack Carter ran for that. And then, as we came on along, um, we, we target raced. We didn't pick a whole bunch of people. You can do that now. But then we couldn't, and we had to find a seat that we thought that we could win. Well, we decided that if we ran somebody, we wanted 
somebody that was educated and that was known in the county as I attended commissioner's court before that and the commissioner sat around the table with their feet propped up on it and they were road graders. They were, they maintained your roads. Well, I've always said any good thing that has happened to Collin County is because of the Republicans that we put in office. Because then as we came on down the line, we won a county judge and we won two commissioners. But until we got that, we didn't have a sub-courthouse in Plano. We didn't have, um, um, I don't know what they call it today, a maintenance department in McKinney that had an engineer working for him and he handled the roads. Everybody had their own barn. And oh, they were really proud of it. And um, When did Nathan White come in? Did you brought Nathan in and he was selected as the well, first? Nathan was in the Navy, and so we, we knew he was going to come along, and he was interested in the Republican Party, and so we could hardly wait till he got back home, and that's whenever then he was our county chairman, and uh, we had a whole lot of different county chairmen, but he was one of, one of the best ones at that time because he set up a program then and then it came along and it was Jerry well, now, Madden. I was going to use that to transition over to him as we move along here. How did Jerry Madden get involved in that? Well, I went down and right after we first opened our office and I did um, a post-election survey down in Canyon Creek because it was our new, newest precinct. And I found 98 Republicans. And so we knew that his mother had been an elected official from where they came from. So I went to visit him. And um, um, she told me that her son was gonna move here. And so then when he moved to Texas, well, we recruited him. And that's how we got him. Thank you, Dixie, for all that you've done. <laughs> I just want y'all to know that. But you served in the legislature for how many years, sir? I was there for 20 years. 20 years, and how many bills did you get through the legislature? I had no, no. Hundreds. Hundreds, yeah. Okay. okay. And they used to say about Jerry, Florence Sapiro, and all that ones, he was the only guy in Austin that read the bills. <laughs> Thank you for your service. All right. Everybody got water? We're ready for our speaker. Let me tell you about the statement. Outstanding gentleman. He didn't want me to tell about his golfing. That's why he's <laughs> well, we're going to talk about my handicap today, okay? Um, Dr. John Goodman, and first of all, I want to give some acknowledgement to Professor David Niederkorn. Thank you for your help. He's done a hell of a job as their assistant program chair. Okay, young, bright, all that stuff, okay? And he reached out to Dr. Goodman. Dr. Goodman has a reputation in Texas of building the uh, economic base for our party and our success with the National Party, National Center of Policy Analysis. And they formed many, many uh, uh, areas of uh, uh, public policy. And then about three years ago, he started the <coughs> Goodman Institute, correct? Today, he's known as the father of the health savings account. Everybody recognize that? That's where, you know, innovative way of dealing with the sovereign health insurance program. Number two, Currently, he's on the, I'm going to use a committee or group, helping the Bush-Trump administration in formulating a health care policy and system. <coughs> Sir, would you please come forward and tell us your innovative efforts that you're putting forward. Okay? And uh, let's see if we get this turned on. Flip that and it should be, no, flip the switch here. Now this, yeah, great. Great. Well, wow. Um, with an introduction like that makes you feel like you should run for office. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm John Goodman. I appreciate Oh, wait just a second. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a senior citizen. This is just the second one tonight. Sir, now, let's 
see Jim if I get this thing thing to work. I'm having a problem. This is the mic. It's not on here, Jim. It is. I'm on, I'm on a minute. You're live on Facebook. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. There it is. Sir, this is, we're going to start the filming now and put you on Facebook. Is that a... Okay. <laughs> put, let me put it on you. Sure. Does that work? Jim? Does that work? Okay. Dr. Goodman. I won't get electrocuted here. <laughs> oh, no. uh, I'm going to talk to you about health care tonight, but let me just tell you that we do a lot of other things. And the tax economists that I work with were the brains behind the Ryan Brady tax bill that eventually became the tax reform that we're all living under the ground now. These are the best tax economists in the whole world, and right now their task is to defend the tax bill uh, which is going to be really, really important coming up uh, to the next election. Uh, Democrats ran on taxes and Republicans ran away from taxes in the last election. That should not happen again. So you go to our website and see that. Uh, Tom Saving down at Texas A&M was a trustee of Social Security and Medicare. He served on President Bush's uh, committee to prioritize Social Security. And he and I have done a lot of things, but uh, most importantly is a study the only study that exists showing how you can privatize Medicare in the same way that Bush wanted to privatize the Social Security system. So I'm just telling you we do a lot of things other than health care, and if you want to give me a business card, we'll, we'll email you stuff, and, and, and in any event, you can come to the Good Institute website and, and find out about those things. Um, for many years, I had a health care blog, and we were one of the few blogs in the United States where we applied economics to healthcare policy. Uh, but one, kind of, one thing I quickly discovered was that we were the only health policy blog of any uh, persuasion or whatever from right to left that had a sense of humor. I don't know what it's, uh, what's wrong with the field that I've been in, but it's populated by a bunch of sour pussies. We felt like if we didn't make you smile at least once a day, we weren't really doing our job. So we would do things like we had a post on uh, theft of medical records and how bad that would be for you if it happened. And then we went over to YouTube and got Aretha Franklin uh, singing Say a Little Prayer for You. <laughs> then we had a post on uh, uh, narrow networks and how you can't see the doctor you need. And we had Leslie Gore singing uh, You Cry Too If It Happened to You. And then we had a post on End of Life Care and Bob Dylan singing uh, Knocking on Heaven's Door. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, when you're in health care and you think you're being funny or cute, there's always a risk you can be insensitive. And probably the most insensitive thing we ever did, and I probably shouldn't tell you this, but uh, some of you are old enough to remember that there was a man who went down to Parkland Hospital emergency room, waited 19 hours, and died before he ever saw a doctor. You're not, you, you remember that. Uh, well, we thought this was very tragic and a sad thing to happen. And we said it was terrible and all of that. But then underneath, we had Lionel Richie singing all night long. <laughs> no, we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I wish I could take that back. <laughs> then I discovered there are people like Paul Grubman in the New York Times uh, who has no sense of humor at all. And uh, when you're around humorless people, you're, if you're just a little bit subtle, they miss the whole thing. So we uh, created this yellow heel sign, like that. And it was a humor alert for the humor challenge. And so you know, whenever you saw that, you don't think, take things too seriously. And I may try that out on you in just a minute. Now, when I talk in groups like this, I always have my cell phone with me. Because you never know, right in the middle of the talk, you can have an emergency call, right? Right. That wasn't serious. <laughs> no, the real reason I have this phone is because I want to make a point. There are more cell phones in the United States than there are people. You know, even the panhandler over here on the street corner probably has a cell phone. But he, yeah, <laughs> but he probably doesn't have very good access to health care. Now, if something happens to my cell phone in Dallas, Texas, I can go to any one of a dozen places to get it repaired, and it will be high quality, low cost repair. There are places that will send someone to my home, repair my iPhone in my condo. There's a national chain, it's called iDoctor, the people who work for it are called uh, I, uh, it's called I Hospital. People who work for it are called I Doctor. And, um, um, but over in the healthcare field, 
if something happens to you or me, did you know the average wait for us to see a doctor is now three weeks? And in Boston, where we were told they had universal coverage before there was Obamacare, the average wait is three and a half months. <coughs> and nationally, when we go to the emergency room for care, one out of every 10 of us leaves without ever seeing a doctor because we get uh, tired of waiting. And so my question to you tonight is, why is the market so kind to my cell phone and so mean to us? And the answer, I believe, is that the cell phone is produced and repaired in a real market with real prices where entrepreneurs know that uh, they can make millions of dollars if they meet our needs. Whereas over in the healthcare field, we have so suppressed the market year after year, uh, decade after decade, that none of us ever sees a real price for anything. We like to think that our healthcare system is really different from the Canadian system, and I probably contributed to that uh, perception. But uh, after many years, it occurred to me, you know, we're not all that different from Canada. Uh, we're about 80% alike, if you want to know the real truth. And the same goes for healthcare systems in Europe. Uh, in, the, in Canada, when you see a doctor, it's free. In the United States, when you see a doctor, it's almost free. Every time we spend a dollar at a doctor's office, uh, 90 cents is paid for by a third party, by an employer, by an insurance company, or by government. Only 10 cents is coming out of our own pocket. So both in the United States, and in Canada, and in Britain, and throughout Europe, the main way that we're paying for health care is not with money, it's with time. And what we forget is that when you suppress the market, when you suppress the price system, what you do is you, you elevate the importance of non-price barriers to care, non-market barriers to care. Now, now, what are those? Well, how long does it take you on the phone to get an appointment with a doctor? How, long, how many days or weeks or months do you have to wait before you see the doctor? How long does it take you to get from your home or your office to the doctor's office? How long do you have to wait while you're there? How long does it take you to get back again? Those are all non-price, non-market barriers of care. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that even for low-income families, those non-market barriers to care are more important in deterring access to health care than the price of the doctor charges. Now, in this country, there are about 43 million people on food stamps. And people who have food stamps can go to any supermarket you and I can go to. They buy anything we can buy. They pay the same price that we pay. Uh, they go to the checkout counter. In the old days, they put their food stamps down and the, they need additional cash. And the now they have a credit card. But um, you never hear it said that people on food stamps don't have access to supermarkets. About the worst that can happen is they have to get on a bus and go a couple miles. But you never hear of a supermarket saying, we're not going to take any more food stamp customers. Right? Now, over in the healthcare system, we have 74 million people or so on Medicaid, and a lot of these are the same people, by the way. And what's the biggest problem people on Medicaid have? You find a doctor who will see them, right? So I was in Massachusetts not that long ago, and I had a cab uh, driver, she's a female. She uh, started asking her about uh, how is uh, healthcare in Massachusetts going for you. And she's on Mass Health, which is their Medicaid program. And she said, well, I had to go down a list of 21 doctors uh, before I found one who would see me. And I said, were you going through the yellow pages? And she said, no, I went through the list that Mass Health gave me. That's what they call universal coverage in Massachusetts. Now, um, when the Medicaid patients can't find doctors who will see them, what do they do? They go to community health centers. They go to places like Parkland Hospital where they won't wait 19 hours, but a wait down at Parkland of four or five or six hours would not be unusual, depending on the time of day and, and, and day of the week. And remember, while they're sitting there, they're sitting around sick people. Now, while all that's going on, we have in this country about 2,000 walk-in clinics, and probably most of you are familiar with the Bennett Clinic and the CVS Pharmacy, right? And um, it's very convenient. You know what price you're gonna pay. You don't have to guess. Uh, what the, uh, what the cost is going to be. In our area, I would say for a sore throat or earache, a minute clinic visit would cost about $75. The problem is Medicaid only pays half that rate. So the Medicaid patients don't get to go to the minute clinic, which is convenient and low cost, and way below the cost of going down to the <coughs> um, If we would just let low-income folks buy health care, 
the way they buy food, we would greatly expand access to medical care for millions and millions of people in this country. So when I think about what we have to do to reform our health care system, the first thing I think of is we have to free the patient. And the second thing we have to do is free the doctor. So let me grab my prop here for a minute. If any of you notice it's really hard to get a doctor to talk to you on the phone, am I right? Why do you think that is? Yes, sir. Since uh, Clinton has managed care initiative, your average doctor is spending four to five hours a day on paperwork. Yep, that's not the right answer here. That's true, but not the answer to this. <laughs> Why doesn't the doctor want to talk to you on the phone? It's not time efficient. He doesn't earn any money doing it. There, good answer. <laughs> the doctor doesn't get paid to talk to you on the phone, right? And why? Because um, years ago, uh, Medicare decided there were 7,500 tasks it was going to pay for, and they wrote down a list of them. And uh, so you've got all these procedures, and you got a price by each one of them. Somebody forgot to add the telephone to the list. <laughs> and the way Medicare pays is the way most employers pay, it's the way Blue Cross pays. And so the whole system is not paying for the, for the telephone. It's really hard, by the way, to change the list. Um, Seema Verna is the woman who runs Medicare and Medicaid. And uh, she told me when she came in there, she discovered that Congress has passed a law, by the way, saying that doctors cannot talk by phone, or get, they cannot charge Medicare for a phone call. Uh, to a patient, unless that patient is out in a rural area, and uh, and even then the patient can't be in his own home. Uh, the push, the, the I'm sorry, the Trump administration, by the way, is being very, very aggressive. And Seema told me that, well, here's what we did. We said, okay, Congress has outlawed telemedicine. What we're going to do is we're going to have virtual medicine. So she's greatly expanding the use of the phone or the ability to use the phone. Uh, and that's the kind of aggressive use of, of, of executive authority that you see in the Trump administration, especially in health care, but also in some other areas. Have you ever noticed that um, you can email your lawyer, you can email your accountant, you can email just about any other professional, but your doctor doesn't email you? By the way, the Minute Clinic does email me. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. But why is the doctor? Why are you not emailing your doctor? You email everybody else. I do. I do. I do. Well, you do. Well, good for you. <laughs> now you were here <laughs> last time. You know this is. Um, uh, you just keep repeating that answer. You're gonna get an A plus on this exam here. You didn't get paid uh, to do it. Doesn't get paid to email you. That's <laughs> absolutely right. Or Skype or anything else. Uh, uh, but you're right. There are some changes. There are some um, uh, innovations that uh, partly because of Seema Burma who's running Medicare. Um, now. Um, Jeffrey Brenner is a doctor who uh, is in Camden, New Jersey, which is one of the poorest cities in the whole country. And in Camden, almost everybody is either on Medicare, or they're on Medicaid, or they're uninsured. There's almost no private insurance. So Brenner is a doctor, he's a scientist, he's inquisitive, and he goes through the hospital records and he discovers that 5% of all the people who live in Camden are responsible for half the money the hospital is spending. So he got the list of the 5% and he went down and he picked out a man who weighed 600 pounds. And he was a, a drug addict, he was an alcoholic, he was a diabetic. He spent half the year in the hospital and the other half the year abusing himself. So Brenner takes this man under his wing and he uh, gets him off alcohol, gets him off drugs, gets him going to AA, discovers the guy's a Christian, gets him going to church signs him up for some welfare benefits so there's some financial stability in his life. And um, lo and behold, uh, the man is not going into the hospital anymore. So month after month, we're saving tens of thousands of dollars because of uh, the way Brenner is helping this guy uh, get his act together. Now, uh, my question to you is, um, uh, for all of the money that Brenner is saving, let's say, Medicaid in New Jersey, how much do you think Medicaid gave Brenner? Zero. 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 Now, for all of the money he's saving Medicare, which means taxpayers, you and me, nationally, how much do you think Medicare gave him? Not a That's right. And why is that? Because, again, of the 7,500 things that Medicare pays doctors to do, somebody let these things off the list. Because what I really have just described to you is really more social work than it is medicine. 
but it doesn't matter what you call it, it's not on the list of the things the government pays for. Now, I learned about Brenner back when Bush was president. So I went up and talked to the folks at Health and Human Services, and I said, you know, you should write Brenner a check for a million dollars. And, um, oh, I, I forgot to mention, after, after Brenner had the success with the one guy, he formed a clinic, and, and now he has lots of patients that he is uh, uh, taking care of, and he's literally saving millions of dollars for taxpayers. So I said to the folks in the Bush administration, you write a check for a million dollars. Why should we do that? He's already saving all this money. You know? This is the way Washington bureaucrats think. So I had to patiently explain, well, because, you know, if all the doctors in America thought that if they changed what they're doing and they got better results and make more money, uh, they would change the practice of medicine. Well, that was too radical for the Bush folks. They had no idea what was about to come, which was going to be Obamacare. Um, if we're going to reform the system, we've got to free the patient, we've got to free the doctor, and then finally we've got to free the entrepreneur. So I'm often asked uh, if the free market can actually work in healthcare. And my answer is the free market is the only thing that works in healthcare. So if you show me an area of medicine, <coughs> there's no third party, there's no, no Medicare, no, no Blue Cross, no employer. People spend their own money. I'll bet that's an area of medicine where the market works really, really well. Now, just kind of looking around the room here, I'm going to guess that a lot of you don't know much about the market for cosmetic surgery. You didn't put your sign up. You didn't put right. your sign up. <laughs> just give it another 10 years and you'll get interested in this market, I guarantee you. <laughs> what happens there? There's no, there's no employer, there's no Medicare, there's no Blue Cross. It's uh, you pay for uh, care and, and you get a package price. You know what you're going to pay. The package price includes doctor, nurse, anesthetist facility uh, and over the last 10 or 15 years the real price of cosmetic surgery just keeps coming down 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 uh, even as every other kind of surgery keeps going up 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 and um, uh, and, um, and, and, the, and that's while the number of procedures has increased seven eight fold over that period of time huge increase huge technological change of the type we're told increases cost everywhere else in the system what's well, decreasing cost here for this uh, LASIK surgery, same thing. Real price coming down. We have price competition. We have quality competition. Remember Trump lately has said, you ought to know what you're paying for in healthcare. There's no transparency. Well, wherever any market in healthcare where patients are paying with their own money and there are no third party payers, you never have to worry about the price. Canadians come down here to get knee replacements and hip replacements because they get tired of waiting in Canada they always know what the price is going to be. Now, they have to travel, they have to pay up front, uh, but there's no mystery about what things are going to cost uh, when hospital, this, by the way, the, the same hospital that tells a Canadian what he has to pay, which by the way is often less than what Medicare pays, that same hospital won't tell you. <laughs> because you're not like the Canadian, you're not someone with cash who's going to go somewhere else if they don't give you the deal that you want. Um, so wherever I look in healthcare, the, the walk-in clinics, the rx.com uh, started a mail order the business on the internet, uh, competing with local pharmacies, competing for the dollars of consumers who are paying for their own drugs out of pocket. Markets really, really work. Now let me uh, talk for a minute about the politics of all this, and then we'll open it up to you. Uh, say whatever you want to say to me. Um, Obamacare has been a mess. You know, since Obamacare has been there, uh, across the country, the premiums have doubled, uh, the deductibles have tripled, and that's just the average. In some places, it's even worse. A acquaintance of mine in New York has seen her premium go up fivefold in four years. She's now paying more than $25,000 for a family plan with a high deductible and a narrow network. We've seen a race to the bottom which I'm probably the only person that really talks about this. Uh, I'm trying to encourage the Trump people to talk more about it. Um, there's a race to the bottom in the exchange. Uh, no plan wants a sick person. And so how do you, if you're running an insurance plan, how do you, how do you discourage sick people from entering your plan? Well, if you have AIDS, you have cancer, they make you pay five, six, seven thousand dollars out of pocket for specialty drugs before insurance kicks in at all. 
And then they tell you you can't go see the best doctors or the best hospitals. If you have cancer in Texas and you have Obamacare insurance, you can't go to MD Anderson down in Houston. There's not a single individual plan sold in Dallas, Texas that will allow you to go to UT Southwestern, which is probably the best uh, medical research facility in the whole world. And this race to the bottom is nationwide. And, uh, <coughs> and when the Democrats say uh, Republicans don't care about people with pre-existing conditions, by which they mean with health problems, well, my gosh, look what they have done to people with health problems. <laughs> Now, the problem with the Republicans is, if this were the other way around, if, um, if, if this were a proper complaint, what would the Democrats have been doing? They would have been, and they control the congressional committees, they would have been holding a hearing every week. They would have brought victims in. They would have heard, heard the, 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 the terrible uh, evidence of, of mistreatment. Republicans have never held a single <coughs> hearing in the House or the Senate on the victims of Obamacare. And so we come up with this last election, and the Democrats spent $90 million on health care ads, and they think they won the elect they think they won the House because of health care. Uh, Republicans ran away from the health care issue. It should have been a Republican issue, yes. and it wasn't. Uh, now, I went to Pete Sessions last year, right in the middle of all this, and I said, Pete, Republicans need an answer to the pre-existing conditions argument that we keep hearing from the Democrats. And by the way, Democrats had a, a legitimate point to make. So you need, Pete, and your colleagues need a, a legitimate answer. So I wrote a resolution for him, and it said, uh, uh, we Republicans are going to allow the states to have enormous freedom to reform Obamacare. They can clean up their individual markets, uh, clean up all these problems I was just talking about. But there's one condition. Things have to get better for people with health problems. What does better mean? It means their uh, premiums have to come down, their deductibles have to come down, their, their uh, access to care has to get wider. If these things don't happen, uh, then they, uh, uh, they don't get to do anything else. Well, um, Pete got on Fox News and they said, what are we going to do? Oh, he introduced a resolution. We got about two or three dozen of his colleagues to endorse it. When he gets on Fox News, he forgot about it. So uh, I, I want, I, now I'm trying, I met with Rick Scott. Uh, uh, this week, and uh, I'm close to Bill Cassidy. I, I wrote the, you know, Sessions Cassidy Health Bill. Um, but um, but these guys are not getting on TV and saying what needs to be said, in my opinion. Uh, I said, if you have Obamacare insurance, you can't go over to UT Southwestern. Well, I went over there this morning. Uh, I am in a Medicare Advantage program. I'm, I'm under Human. I just showed my Humanity card. Humanity card. They were glad to have me there. There was no problem at all. There are two exchanges in our healthcare system. Obamacare is an exchange created by Democrats, but there's also a very similar kind of exchange created in, under Medicare that the Medicare Advantage patients use to choose their plan. A third of all seniors are in a private health insurance plan. And you may not realize how you're getting in one, but you're, you're essentially in an exchange where these plans are competing against each other. The exchange that Republicans created works. The exchange that the Democrats uh, created uh, does not work. And uh, but you know, but am I the first person to ever tell you this? You've ever heard this from a Republican? Uh, you know, okay, that's our problem. What we need for our Republican politicians to understand the health care issue, to spend time with it, and not let the Democrats uh, monopolize the field and, uh, and mislead everybody. Now. Uh, I'll say one more thing and then I will open it up. Uh, Donald Trump is very aggressive. And uh, I was up at the Rose Garden on Friday where he announced uh, this new change in, uh, in the federal law. In beginning January, um, employers are going to be able to give their employees pre-tax dollars so they can buy their own insurance. Uh, this is huge. Under, under Obama, if, uh, if an employer did that, the employer could be fined $100 per employee per day, or $36,500 per year. It's the highest fine in all of Obamacare for just allowing employees to go have his own insurance. Okay, uh, Trump wipes away the fine. I'll let you tell this. <laughs> Trump wipes away the fine. We're going to let uh, these people do this. They're, they think. Um, 
I think 11 million people will be able to take advantage of it. So I met with some of the Trump folks uh, just this week, and I said, no, no, it should be over 100 million. And because employers don't want to be in the insurance business, I mean, I, I never, unless they're really big. And some big employers may have a better plan than than United Health, but but most employers do not want to be in this business. They would like to be able to give a health benefit to their employee, let their employee go and have the insurance, personal and portable, take it with you from job to job, in and out of the labor market. That's popular. That polls grew really well. So Trump is on the right side. But as I told you earlier. The Obamacare market is a mess almost everywhere. So where are these guys going to go to buy their individual insurance? Now what I uh, am saying to Republicans right now is Trump wants a health plan. He's halfway there. I mean, he really is halfway there. He's now allowed the employer to give money to the employees. The employee can have personal and portable health insurance. Now we need to clean up these individual markets. That's the other half of the program. And. Um, Believe it or not, it's hard to get folks in the field I'm in to focus on what, to me, seem simple and obvious facts. But we're, uh, we're, we're trying to get there. Okay, I think if you say as many controversial things as I have said this evening, you got to give people a chance to say something. So this lady over here really wants to say something. You go right ahead. I didn't understand when you said Sessions went on to Fox News or TV, and then nothing happened. He forgot about his resolution. He forgot. Yeah. And what does that mean, he forgot? He gave it up? I, no, 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 no. I mean, I gave him a resolution, which I thought was a real strong answer to the Democrats. Right. When Fox News gives him the national audience, and he forgets to bring it up. But I like Pete. Pete's a good friend of mine. Uh, it's just, well, you know. that's a major, major issue. And, and it wasn't. It I, I and just, he blows it all. And I didn't mean to pick on Pete. None of the Republicans talked about it. None of them were picking it <laughs> up because they, no. they had three separate things going and they all, like I said, ran away from it. Well, you deserve it. When you shoot yourself in the foot like that, you deserve what you get. Amen. And if and you haven't got the confidence. Way back. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. There, is there any action going on to allow more new insurance groups to actually form and cross state lines because it seems like right now the large insurance companies are just billing code administrators more than they are an actual insurance company doing the business of you know creating new markets and being entrepreneurial and how they offer. Well one of the most innovative things that's happening in the market is what I call concierge doctors. Uh, they don't really want to call themselves that these days. They want to call themselves direct pay folks. Um, you won't believe how cheap it's become. Uh, for, uh, for a young woman, in, uh, er early uh, uh, adult woman, it's uh, I believe $30 per month for complete, uh, for everything a primary care physician does. For the child, it's $10 a month. Whoa. Uh, yes. Uh, this is, uh, this is not, it started out when concierge in, in the early days, it was like $10,000 a year. And now I'm telling you, as the price has really come down, um, and if you just look, you'll find that it's, it's, it's quite uh, inexpensive. That's where, that's where a private agreement with a physician is signed yes. under a reduced... And, and what I mean by concierge is 24-7, you can call them on the phone, you can email them. Uh, it's sort of like the doctor version of Surgery Center of Oklahoma? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and, and the one that started the model that I'm now talking about was in Wichita, Kansas. But they're spending all over the country. Now, guess who won't pay for the concierge doctor? <laughs> Medicare, of course not. <laughs> and do you know what most of those concierge doctors are doing? No. Okay. You're going to tell me I know. <laughs> I am, because I'm in the business. All right. And this happens at Baylor. They form their little group. They say, we're going to take 500, and this is true. 500 patients will have more time to spend with you. So what, at $2,000 a person per year, 500 patients, what does that add to their bottom line? Right? Okay, and then they say, I will file your Medicare, I will file your insurance. So they're picking that up too. So that's how they're working. Now, this morning, I spent two and one half hours with, and I hate to use this word, but it is what it is, 
what I consider a schlock insurance, Obamacare, trying to help my housekeeper get care. She has three major medical issues. Two and a half hours, I was on the phone, I called the insurance company, and they would give me a list, grudgingly. I would call them all with her sitting at my desk, and they would say, we're not taking new patients, or I would get, this number has been disconnected, or we're no longer participating in that program. At 11.10, and I started this at 8.30, I found a doctor for her and made an appointment. So I'm this is say, a two-sided so, so, issue. So, so, so I'm going to say that what you described about Obamacare doesn't surprise me at all. No, I know. Uh, what, what you described about the uh, concierge doctor, it sounds like a model the MDVIP uh, set up and went around the country doing. Um, there's a better model uh, that doesn't cost $2,000 that started in Wichita, it's going around the country. Um, and, um, and look, competition in the market uh, works. And uh, if you just let the patients go into the market, uh, the concierge doctors that do good will survive and those who don't won't. And you have price competition and, and, and uh, that's what we need to do. But right now Medicare won't pay for it, Blue Cross won't pay for it, employers find they cannot pay for it through a health savings account. Alright, you look anxious to say something. Go ahead. Hey, what, what's the founder of the HSA, what's the chance, I mean, you know, it's, it's supposed to be for those that have a large deductible. And those people that don't have any insurance, have the largest deductible, and they can't have an HSA plan. You know, one thing Trump did the other day and got oh, absolutely no media attention was in addition to allowing the employer to give money to the employee to buy regular health insurance, the employer can put up to $1,800 in an account completely separate from any insurance for health care and, 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 and health-related expenses. I never liked the high deductible. When, when I talk about health savings accounts, I never even mention the deductible because I think, you know, I wish it weren't there. You know, I think health savings account ought to wrap around any third party plan, just like what I call the HRA. I don't know if you're yeah. familiar yeah, with that. Of course. Um, but it ought to be completely flexible. So, so we ought to be able to carve out whole areas of care, and the employer says, okay, here's money, you take care of, say, well, primary <coughs> care. Uh, right now we can't do that. But the self, that leaves the self employed out. No, it doesn't. How does a self-employed have a, have a health savings account? Well, if it were up to me, you yeah. could have a health savings account, you would not have to have it deductible. Yeah. Well, what are you going yeah. to do about this? This one, this one. Wait a minute. One time. <laughs> one, one question so per person. I moved to Texas in 1973 from Massachusetts. Yeah. Price of oil was $5 a barrel. Yeah. By 1980, November 8, when President Reagan got elected, it was $38 a barrel. That time, most of the economists were saying if the price of oil crosses forty dollars a barrel, the world is going to come. President Reagan took an oath on February 20th, 1981. On February 3rd or 4th, executive order, no more price control. And he removed most of the regulation on oil and gas. Within nine months, price of the oil crashing down, and the rest is history. I have lost my job. I got moved to from Houston. How does the health insurance drive huh? How does this affect your health insurance? Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with you. We have a maximum number of rules, I agree with you. rules and regulations health care. Remove everything. Just keep very few, less than 10%. I totally agree. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. I think he's depending on the question I come up with. The, the, the thing that you were talking about with uh, a Canadian coming in can find out how much a piece of surgery is going to cost. Or if you try to call and get the, the cash price of a piece of surgery, they, well, they can't tell you. That has to stop. And you're saying we've got the same taking place in January. <clears throat> Why does it not take effect on the start of the fiscal year, or October 1 or whatever it is? I hate it when I see something being done now. <coughs> it's going to be a year before anything actually happens. If you're going to say we've got to fix this, then you tell the clowns that are writing the regulations, full stop, 
blank sheet of paper. We have 30 days. Are you asking me why you waited until January to do what Trump, Trump yeah. is? That why that, you're that's asking? That's the deficit be between the can't get the cash well, price of people. Well, I'm, just tell, I'm just telling you that the, the, the insurance plans tend to be annual. Uh, both the, both the insurer and the employer tend to need some lead time in order to make changes. And that's you why it's done that way. Blank sheet of paper, 30 days to write. Well, okay, okay. Yes, you're right here. Right here. Right here. Is there any nursing homes in Texas who are a disaster? Why are they broken and what is it going to take to fix them? <laughs> well, you know, most of them get most of their money from Medicaid, right? And so, the, so it's, it's a government program. There's not price competition when you're on Medicaid. Um, and um, we don't have a system for encouraging people to save knowing that this is probably going to happen to them at some point in their life. Uh, and I would like to see us have a system that some, I don't know if Texas has this, but some states have a system where you can buy nursing home insurance and then you protect your own assets. So if you bought $100,000 worth of nursing home insurance, uh, you could protect that against your Medicaid and buy that. Um, and I'd like to see us do something like that. That was a short answer. Quick, quick question. What does the state do? implement some of the ideas you have that wouldn't depend upon the federal government. Well, um, maybe I didn't make this clear. Trump has now said, you know, employers can give money to employees to go to the market. But every state, in most states, the market is a mess. There's no way that I see the federal government can clean up the mess because it's different in every state. So we've got to empower the states to clean up their markets. We have a lot of ideas on how to do that. But it can't be done from Washington. Uh, so Texas would have the opportunity. Is there a group working on that in the state of Texas, particularly working toward those ideas? I think so. I think so. Way right back to that. But, yeah. I'm curious. Is there a country in the world that has adopted the things that you're suggesting, or at least as close to that as possible, and that has been successful in all aspects of medical care, not just cost? Accessibility. No, no, but there are countries who adopted bits and pieces. For example, Singapore adopted what they call a MetaSafe account. That's kind of like our health savings account. They did it back in 1984. And they have, uh, their health system looks really attractive. I mean, they have really good outcomes. And costs are kept down. I mean, they do other things I don't like. They have price controls. But, but, uh, but they believe in saving and they believe in empowering patients. So, believe it or not, South Africa, uh, of all countries, uh, under Nelson Mandela, uh, opened up the market for <coughs> all forms of insurance, and health savings account plans captured more than half the market. Now, following Mandela, uh, South Africa did some foolish things to, to pass some foolish regulations, but um, that's probably the most uh, interesting uh, health savings account market. Then uh, Switzerland, uh, believe it or not, has the most uh, egalitarian healthcare system in the whole world. I wonder. I always wonder why liberals never brought up Switzerland, because you know they want everybody to be equal in healthcare. Well, Switzerland has done it uh, for a long time. But in Switzerland, everybody has private insurance. You're required to have private insurance. You have an exchange like you have under Obamacare, but it's, it's one of the exchanges that works, like like in our Medicare, instead of the doesn't work as in Obamacare. So. So there are things to be learned by looking at other countries. Okay, any last? Yes, sir? Yeah, just, I'd, I'd like to share something. Oh, I now, don't, don't give us an editorial, ask a question. No, we're not going to give you an editorial. Could you ask a question? <laughs> My question is, how do we motivate Republican politicians to get off their ass and look at the issue? I've only met two who've been willing to listen. One of them is Paul LePage of Maine, and the other is Sid Miller of Texas, and Trump is making a lot of good decisions. But what do we do to get people directed at looking at some of these issues, like the ones you're talking about? Okay, well what I do is I go knock on the door and I sit down with them. I spent hours with Bill Cassidy. Bill Cassidy probably knows more about health care than anybody in the Senate. Um, but he doesn't talk to on TV the way I'm now talking to you, which disappoints me a bit. I met with Rick Scott this this week. Uh, Rick has a background in healthcare, and uh, 
I'm trying to get him to say some of the things I'm now saying to you. Um, Heat Sessions I worked with, I, I virtually wrote the Sessions Cassidy Health Bill, which was a bill that would have provided universal coverage, um, and the leadership didn't like it. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, we're getting better stuff out of the Trump administration and out of the Congress. I mentioned that I was in the Rose Garden last Friday, where Trump announced this new change of policy. And I looked around to see who else was there. I didn't see anybody in Congress that was there. He had the vice president there, a couple of secretaries there, people from Health and Human Services. Nobody from the Hill was there. And uh, that gives you some idea of problems we're having in the Republican Party. Yeah. Have you sat down at all yet with our new congressman from this area, I, Van Taylor? I know him, but I have not. Van is a shaker and a mover. He has done wondrous things in the state of Texas. And you voted for him, I think. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but any last, I, what my question is, do you see in the near future any relief in the premiums from an employer or individual basis? The insurance today that's available is just simply not affordable. Yeah, and I think it gets worse as the healthy people drop out. And uh, <laughs> I, I like the fact that, that the Republicans got rid of the individual mandate, but it allows us all to game a system. Uh, if, you're, if you're below Medicare age, you can stay out while you're healthy and then, and then get sick and join. And you, and you don't even have to wait until the, the open season. You can uh, find one of the exceptions, buy insurance just about any day that you like. Uh, so one of the reforms I would like to see is I would like to see Texas and other states uh, be able to um, uh, have, have Firms come in like Cancer Treatment Center of America will come to the market and say, we only go and take cancer patients. We're going to specialize in this, and that's who we want. But they need to get a premium that covers the cost. And then I would like to see medical records travel with the patient. I'd like to see the plans be able to answer health questions so they can match the right patient with the right plan. I would like to see us have a small premium on group insurance so when the group sends their sick people to the individual market, we have some money to pay for those extra costs. That would bring down the cost. And then I would like to see us not allow individuals to gain the system. Medicare does not allow you to gain Medicare. Because if you don't pay your Part B premium uh, when you are eligible, you wait. You get penalized. The same thing should happen in the individual market. Dr. Chapel, let's be the last question, sir. It's a little bit of an editorial comment. I, I'm a physician for a long time. And the anger and the frustration that we feel when we talk to patients, when they come in, how they've been treated by other doctors, by other hospitals, uh, I think you're exactly right. The Republican Party does not get the pent-up emotion and frustration of even Republican people about healthy care. The Democrats get it. And if, if the Republicans don't step up and start to address this, it's going to kill us. Well, see, I, I mean, don't this think, is, I think I, this the, is I, I the agree issue. With the first thing you said, I don't agree that Democrats get it, but Democrats are better at, at demagoguing. That's right. Right. They, they, they understand the anger and frustration and they have manipulated to their own advantage against Republicans. Yeah. And it, it's not a sleeper issue. It is as real as can be. When people are in the office talking about prescription costs, can I afford my medicine? I can't pay my rent. I mean, it's back to pre-part D anger and frustration with drug costs, premium costs. It, it's a potent, potent issue. Yeah. And Bush is the one who wouldn't allow negotiation of drug prices <coughs> for Medicare. That's right. Okay. Well, Dr. Goodman, you, you want me to comment on that last Go time? ahead. <laughs> I, I don't know how you're going to. <laughs> CDO was asked this question. What if Medicare was able to negotiate drug prices? CBO says, well, if you want to be like the VA, and you want to say, okay, remember what Donald Trump's favorite phrase, you got to be willing to walk away from the table? The VA does walk away from the table. So there are drugs you can't get if you're in the VA system, and they pay lower prices for drugs. But if you say going in, we're not going to ever walk away from the table because there's every drug has to be covered, then you don't get much out of negotiations. That's my quick response. Well, sir, thank you very much. Accept this? Do you like the Capitol Grill? I do. <laughs> Hope you enjoy that, sir. Right, thank you. All right. All right.
Uh, wonderful program. Again, our emphasis on uh, education. I hope you found this very informative. And if you have any magic, all right, I'm sure Dr. Goodman will enjoy a phone call for you to share it with you. I'll let them. Okay. The uh, next thing is the most important. Thank you, sir. Sorry. Okay. We do not have a meeting in, in July, correct? Mark, is that right? Why do we not have a meeting in July? Do you know, Scott? It's because this is our 19th year to participate in the 4th of July Parade Club. Okay? Notice in your chair, there's a little envelope, just as you like to go with the Methodist Church. Okay? We need some contributions. A flag this year, and again, I'm going to repeat this. This is the 19th year that we've had a float in the parade, and 19 years that we have distributed flags along the parade route. Our theme this year is uh, People Helping People, the Spirit of America. And uh, with a little uh, success here, we have two policemen, two firemen, a uh, physician and a patient, a uh, uh, teacher and a student, and volunteers. People Helping People is a theme. But again, and we need two things. Number one, we need walkers. <coughs> we need walkers to help hand out the flags. This is on July the 4th. Number two, we need some money for our flags this year. So any contribution, a dollar or whatever, this is your envelope. Please consider mailing us, mailing them a contribution to cover the flags, the cost of the flags. And we appreciate it very much. Now, the second thing in a chair is membership. And with our county chairman here, our clout, our influence in this county base is based on our membership. So Get, if you're not a member, sign up now. Number two, get your neighbor, get your friends, but our growth. This is a wonderful meeting. We want to keep our attendance around 100 uh, people of, uh, a meeting if we uh, possibly can. And we can do that with your help. So next thing, bring somebody with you, okay? Next time, young man, bring your neighbor, all right? But join our club and get involved. Now, I got some breaking news, yeah? This is really unbelievable, and I want everybody, I gotta be sure I repeat this correctly. <coughs> July, no meeting and a parade, but August. Are you ready for this, Carl? We have a gentleman flying in from Israel. You know, for on two occasions the last <coughs> five years, we had Colonel Elaine from the Israel military that spoke to our group and told us about what's going on behind the scene. It was quite informative. I uh, reached out to Colonel Lane, and we have Joshua Reinstein coming in. He's the president of the Israel Alliance Foundation. <coughs> He's the director of the President Christian Alliance Caucus. This is a heavyweight. Heavyweight. Dr. Terry Israel opened the door for me. Okay? Dr. Israel's going to fly in and be at that meeting. Now, he introduced me to this gentleman's mother, and he's coming home to visit the mom. And uh, I think it's a birthday, all right? And we're moving our date. This is very, very important. We're not meeting the third Thursday of a regular meeting. We're meeting the second Thursday. But what is that date, honey? Do you remember? August the 8th. 8th. August the 8th. You can check. So two things. Mark it on your calendar. Our August meeting is going to be this unique speaker, okay? And it should be quiet. He's going to address. I've talked to him on the phone. I found out what it cost to call Israel. <coughs> okay, I thought I'd get you. To, <laughs> I thought I'd, I'd get you to help me on the on the turn. Okay. Anyway, on the on the nine zero. Hey, uh, I talked to him twice. He's very excited uh, with them coming in to visit with his mother and his family to come and speak with us and inform us. I'm the one. Their the Trump uh, policy on moving the uh, embassy. Okay and the Trump policy in dealing with Israel. And uh, it should be quite, quite enlightening in the uh, uh, deal. So mark that on your calendar. 
and uh, do it. Now, is there any, at this time, we have some candidates and we have some elected officials. So if y'all all come up on this side and uh, come through and uh, identify and tell us, uh, uh, Daryl, come on up. Okay, where is uh, uh, Mr. Vance? Okay. What's that? Who else do we have? Uh, Scott, okay. Ken, come over on, on this side. Okay. Everybody get in line over here. Eight for beauty. Eight for beauty. I don't want to slap it. I just try to slap it. First of all, how many years have you served this county? This is the 35th year. All right. Yeah. Can you tell and us? I, and I've enjoyed it. I started out with a lot of problems, and we've gotten them modified tremendously. The mayor of Wyoming is here. I haven't been collecting for him for 35 years, but we've been collecting for a significant number. And we've saved them $10 per account every year because it takes $10 to collect taxes for an entity. We get to do it, and we've now picked up everybody in the county. We're saving tremendous amounts of money. We're giving better service. We hire people who care, to, who care about people. And we try to give you the service that you deserve when you come in. You are our customers, and we work for you. I'm running for, I run for that, and I continue to run for that. A couple of questions. How, what is the size of your budget now when you collect the taxes? What, what's the numbers? I don't know the number of the budget. I know we've got 110 people, and the bulk of them are in, pro, are in uh, motor vehicle. Uh, property tax, we get, a, a, uh, we get 14 temporaries during the season. Uh, we're when we read, read what it was when, when Dixie and Elm started building a party, what was the population and what is it today? Oh my God. You see what I'm saying? What's the population was somewhere around 100,000 and now we're a million. Okay. And Dixie prodded me. She almost had a cattle prod. She prodded me all the way <laughs> on, on what to do and how to do. And uh, most of you here have known me and had service and you're even asked a question. I just want to compliment you on your fast turnaround of auto registration. I put my application in the mail one day, the day after the next day, I got it back in the mail. So you turned it around in one day. I would love to say that we always do that, but we don't. <laughs> but we do turn it around pretty quick. And doing that for you is, is what I first ran for because my wife went first, went to the courthouse to get registration, and she told me what it was like, and I couldn't believe it. I went, and I found out she was true. <laughs> and then I ran, and I've got no question, but the, the job is to serve the citizens of Collin County. And when are you uh, starting your campaign, sir? I don't know that I start a campaign. We can't sign up until December. So I'm not going to be doing advertising and all that until December. And uh, otherwise, I'm just going to provide service and show you what I can do rather than talk about it. So we can start looking for your website and volunteer for your to help you in these city. I don't know that a website raises significant taxes. I'll, I'll be out <laughs> talking to people. Okay. That vote. Uh, well, and we thank you for your service, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Daryl Hale. I'm uh, your newest county commissioner for Precinct 3. Uh, asked what we were famous for. Uh, I ran a very unconventional campaign. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yes. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think some of the things that are going on great in the county right now, we just added two new courts. Um, and we're growing like crazy. We're, we are adding the equivalent of a farmer's bill every month. Whoa. So we're adding 97 people a day right now. So we were a million five thousand last summer. We're uh, we're up now probably another 35,000 since then. So we're probably like a million forty thousand now. So the things that I'm going to be working on is just all effects of growth 
and what that does to us. So continuing to look at courts, expanding uh, support for the sheriff's office, jail, uh, just everything that's going to be impacted by you know, the continued growth. Uh, I'm having my campaign kickoff this next Thursday. I'll pass some of these around. I'd appreciate it if, if you came and supported me. I'd uh, love to see you all there. Thank you. And where is it going to be? Um, it's going to be at uh, Destinations Wine Bar. I'm actually having a wine tasting. Um, Texans can be sophisticated. And uh, it's, in, it's in Fairview, just right across from Elliott's Hardware. And it'll be next Thursday. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Young man, Scott. Those of you that haven't met me yet, I think I've met most of you. Um, my name is Scott Drew. I'm running for Collin County Tax Assessor. Um, as this county has continued to grow, the office has gotten bigger and bigger. It collects over three and a half billion dollars a year. Billion? Billion. With a billion. With a billion. Um, issues over a million and a half different separate receipts, a lot of that in motor vehicle. I have over 30 years of experience dealing in finance, audit, and accounting in billion dollar companies. And I want to put that experience to use serving the citizens of this county. I currently serve the citizens of this county as an auditor for the county, working in the auditor's office, where I've been serving uh, in two different time periods um, since 2013. Um, that's one of the hats I, I'm wearing as I'm up here. And, um, Right, when's your campaign kickoff? Uh, July 10th will be my kickoff. Um, not quite as sophisticated as Daryl's. We're holding mine in a tavern. Uh, it'll be Woodtop Tavern here in Plano, uh, just down the road here on Preston, not before you get to uh, Tollway. Uh, we'd love to have you join join me there. Um, I've got um, information on my uh, Facebook page and my website. Right. So, website um, is up. What's your website? Alexstockbreak.com. And uh, my Facebook page is Scott Greg for TAC. Uh, you can check that out. Um, real quick, I've got another hat that I wear for the party. I'm the um, for the standing supporter program. I oversee <laughs> that. Would love for, to see those people get involved in that. Um, believe it or not, less than half of the elected officials in the county and um, are involved in that. Well, they're, so all they're all elected for <laughs> <laughs> so I can look into that too. Uh, thank so. you very much. All right, thank you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, folks. I'm Mike Vance. It's P. Victor, A and C. My name is Constable Precinct 1, Collin County. Folks, I'm a 34 and a half year Texas lawman. My entire career has been spent right with the Collin County Sheriff's Office. Uh, I've based my entire life and career on honesty and integrity. I think a law enforcement agency should be run with honesty and integrity. Uh, when I'm elected, I'll bring honesty and integrity to the council's office, and I'll operate that office according to the rules, regulations, and laws of the state of Texas. So, I'm asking for your vote and support well, from the council precinct one county county. Now, Mike, one thing. What is your territory when you say precinct? Precinct one is Fairview, McKinney, mm -hmm. Melissa, Hannah, Westminster, some of New Hope, and some of Weston. All right, and when are you kicking off your campaign? My campaign kicked off uh, March 7, 2016, when I lost the last election. October 1st is your official. That's correct. Deal. And um, you'll be running for campaign at that time. Are you going to be singing about it now? With your guitar? Good. You can bring your guitar? <laughs> How much money y'all got? I'll let it be bought. Mr. Bass, thank you much. Thank you. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay, are we ready for the Wheel of Fortune? Yeah, we are. Yeah, right. Everybody yeah, get their ticket. A little monkey running around. All right, well, we're getting ready <laughs> for all that. I really want to acknowledge a couple of people. And uh, uh, the uh, first is Steve Howell. Is Steve still here? And Went out the back door. Steve, hey, let everybody see you. Yeah. Uh, Steve is taking on the burden of having to provide the food, get us organized, doing the yeoman's work. Appreciate it, man. Okay, time out. Time out. Huh? Tim pays for it, so I just, you know, right. he tells me what to do. Well, it's you have really a, Tim. Tim well, you have a strong back. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I said this earlier, and I, I said it. Now, Mayor, you didn't want to say any words or anything here. 
I prayed for y'all, so I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was fine. You know, yeah. anywhere in the great city of Wild uh, Texas with 52,127 people. But now, what are you up again? How many times? May 2020. 20, okay. So you can see clearly. All right. So, so we're like, wait a so. while to go to work. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. All right. Sounds like um, magic to me. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I want to recognize another young man of tremendous talent. And most of them are getting to know him, and that's Professor David Niederkorn. David, yeah. appreciate all the work you're doing and really helping us get some good speakers. And uh, Bill and I are right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I really would be in trouble if I didn't recognize a couple other people. Okay. And one is Kay Baird. Huh? You better get your wife. I, I've got her on the list. <laughs> <laughs> you better have her. Kay Baird. Kay Baird is the queen of the Republican Party in Collin County. She is now really stand up. So stand up a minute, sir, but okay. she has helped more people run for office and get guidance in the party. Well, appreciate what you've done. Okay? Now, I'm the bride. bride has got a new knee, and she's now walking and well on the bicycle 22 minutes a day. All right? And we're so proud of you. But I guarantee you, we wouldn't get any damn thing done if she wasn't the administrative uh, a talent that she is. Uh, I'm there. Appreciate it. Reading your emails. Yeah. She, she does everything for us. Now, who have I missed? I know I've missed someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, li listen, here's our school teacher and our uh, commissioner for how many years? Come on, Me? Phyllis. Yeah. Oh, how many years, uh, Phyllis? 20. 20 years on the court, and you kept them in line. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a full-time job. Okay, uh, and I uh, well, appreciate your service. Yes, ma'am. This lady is our silver-haired legislator, and she's on the national floor. Well, I'll stand up and introduce yourself, please. I'm proud of her. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I advocate for uh, people 16 years and older to the Congress. Okay, and uh, you, you ask Congress support? Abortion. That's a lot of but you're here in Colin County. Age 60 and above. All right. Thank you for what you did. Uh, we got everybody covered. All right, let's have our Wheel of Fortune. Uh, Linnea, since you uh, are senior advisor to the Trump administration, you want to come and spin our wheel? Now I'll let Carl do it since it's easier for him to get up there than me. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, Carl, come on up here, young man. And let's, uh, I don't have the new media. Okay. She uh, likes the ticket. Hmm? We need some. Does everybody have a ticket? Uh, I got the one. You have a beautiful woman to pick it because I'm an ugly man. I'm <laughs> well, I, she's not old enough, uh, so what she oh, said. Okay. She's okay. Okay. Well, I'm she's a beautiful man. Now, what did you say? What, we spin the wheel first. Yeah. Okay. And determine the price. All right. Which now, direction? Hold this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Turn to the right. Big money. Big money. Who's got the Who's got the sheet? Richard, I got it. You got the sheet? I what guess so. Well, uh, uh, still one. One is the Perot Museum, not Ann Fox. I'm standing up. I don't even hear you, Sam, sitting down like that. Stand up and shout it out. Okay, it's the Perot Museum, not Ann Fox, the grandchildren trip. Four tickets. Okay, that is a wonderful event if you haven't been to the Perot Museum. Phyllis, you would really enjoy that with the grandkids. All right, pick a number. Okay. Oh, I'll let you work it off. Four, three, four, six. Four, three, four, six. The last four numbers. All right. You have it, young lady? All right. Whoa! All right. Where's Tim's card? Right here. Tim? Okay. Come on up. You've got to get with her. Get all the information, okay? And uh, for the prize. Now, while he's heading back, I want to tell you one other thing. Okay? She gets some recognition. You know, this is a team effort, but uh, this big tall handy man has been our treasure for I don't know how many years, a couple of decades. But he did seven o'clock calls, whether it's seven o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock at night. I know his wife gets tired of me calling. Uh, Tim McCart is one of the valuable, valuable uh, parts of this organization. And Tim, we appreciate all that you do. Okay? And you keep the books. Oh. Uh, and we're still liquid, right? 
We're not drunk. We, we haven't had it on the blackboard. There's no further <laughs> Well, we don't, we don't, <laughs> we don't talk about it. We don't care. Now, if you want to go to the board, that's what we'll tell you. That's it. It's mine. It's Again, yeah. Now, uh, Randall, we haven't identified. I want to do something for Randall, and I hope that everything is good. Stand up. You're an outstanding attorney, and, and uh, Randall, Mr. Johnson, you have made application for the uh, new district court, civil jurisdiction district, district court in Collin County. All right. And not only does he look like a judge, he has uh, appeared to be a judge. And tremendous certifications. And so uh, if anyone can help and, uh, and uh, his uh, aid is uh, to get appointed as our, uh, one of our new judges, uh, we would appreciate it by his help. But a very qualified young man. Thank you. Okay. What's the court number on that? But it's for something or other. I don't know what the yeah. number. I think it's like 437 or 493 or 468. Oh, 468. Now, anything on good or order? Are you, and I just want to put this out there because it was brought up earlier, about the deputy clerk and the deputy clerk and the deputy clerk and the deputy are you aware that there's already a, that a woman Democrat who has told Ben Smith she's running against him? Running against him? Ben Smith. Ben Smith? Ben Smith? Oh, okay. I just, get ready, they're coming. Okay. Uh, well, this is a little sidebar, but who, who's uh, a native Texan here? Okay. Uh, how many of us were Democrats? We were all Democrats. There wasn't any such thing as a two-party system, all right? And we became Republicans when most of us, when John Conley switched over and uh, switched parties because he was going to... Uh, but John Towers was a senator. I, I, my first vote was cast in 1978, and the, the art changed when Bill Clinton in every single county, not, not Bill Clinton, uh, Bill Clements. Clements. Yeah, yeah. Every single county in Texas and the Democratic governor candidate, whose name escapes me, thought, who is this guy? He looks like a used car salesman. Okay. Women Mark hit every Mark single White. county. Yeah. And he yes, sir. I've never Clinton. been a Democrat. I voted in 72 for Richard Millhouse Nixon. All right. And I have not looked, I've never voted for a Democrat. Okay. Never. All right. The, uh, I'm beating. Well, I'm sure. So. I can't wait. Way, wait way back. You had to be 21 years old before you could vote. Yeah, right? they lowered Well, I, Eisenhower, was running for office, so I beat you. <laughs> yeah, they lowered well, the I, voting age for I worked on the streets for Eisenhower while I was in junior high school. All right, I'm going to ask you here. All right, now, thank you, everyone. Trump. Anything on good or the order that we should do? Yes, sir? Trump is going to need a place to have a meeting coming up in this county in the sometime in the near future before 2020, and we ought to be doing something to set it up. Okay, good point. All right, Phyllis, you got something? Yeah, the, the, these, those of you who have these envelopes, if you have cash and money, uh, who can we give them to tonight? Tim McCarr. Okay, good. Tim, you got Thank your you. pistol here. Put anybody else? Thank you. Then, then, so you won't have to take it home and worry about it. You can just go down. Yeah, anybody wants to leave some cash, that's excellent. <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, I'm closing. Thank you, all of you. Now, if you want to help on that Fourth of July parade, I can use all the help we can uh, do. We're going to direct, uh, decorate the float out here on the third. So help me decorate the float. Come and walk and hand out flags. And yes, ma'am. If any of you have grandchildren, uh, last year uh, I had six or eight of my 13-year-old uh, grandson's friends walked and handed out flags. And they thought that was the most wonderful thing they'd ever done. So if you have grandchildren, they enjoy it, and uh, just you know, and it's good for them because it introduces them to the Republican Party and, uh, and participate in Reminds them about the Fourth of July and everything. So it's educational. Uh, it's also fun. Right. And when are we going to see you again? It is August eighth. August 8th. Thank you.